everyone, my name is Morgan Harrington and I'm the National Coordinator of Programs here at the American Liver Foundation. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to our Alcohol Associated Liver Disease Patient Program. Today, I am joined by Dr. Margarita German, a transplant hepatologist at UW Health. Dr. German is also an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. German cares for patients before and after they've undergone a liver transplant. She also provides care for patients with all types of liver disease and has a special clinical interest in alcohol-associated liver diseases. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now, Dr. German. Thank you so much, Morgan. So as Morgan mentioned, I'm Rita German, and we're going to go over uh, some definitions and understanding alcohol use disorder and alcohol-associated liver disease. So the goals of today's talk will be to define heavy drinking, binge drinking, and alcohol use disorder. We're going to discuss treatment options for alcohol use disorder. We're going to understand the effects of alcohol on the liver, discuss some symptoms and complications of cirrhosis patients may experience, and then understand the ways to improve one's health in the setting of alcohol-associated liver disease. So to go over some definitions, first we have to know what we're talking about in terms of a standard drink. So one standard drink is um, defined as 14 grams of alcohol. This can typically be found in one beer, 12 ounces of beer, uh, eight to nine ounces, full ounces of malt liquor, a five ounce glass of wine, or a one and a half ounce of uh, liquor. So that is defined as one standard drink. Now, when we talk about um, moderate drinking or heavy drinking or binge drinking, those definitions are a little bit different. So um, the according to the 2020 to 2025 U.S. Dietary Guidelines, um, the recommendation really is that you either choose not to drink, which is probably the best thing for your health. It is the best thing for your health. Um, but moderation, moderate drinking or a safe amount to drink would be to limit less than two drinks for men or one drink or less for women. When we talk about heavy drinking, this is defined by the NIAAA or the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Heavy drinking is defined as five or more drinks on any day or 15 or more drinks for men per week or four or more drinks per day or on any day or eight or more drinks per week for women. Now, binge drinking also has its own definition. That's when patients drink in about two hours, five or more drinks for men or four or more drinks for women. So these are standard definitions that we use in order to define alcohol use. Now, when we turn to alcohol use disorder, we treat this as a disease. So this is a medical condition where one cannot stop or control alcohol use despite consequences. That may be consequences in health, in the social environment, in work-related activities, et cetera. And we use a specific questionnaire, 11 specific questions to rate the severity of alcohol use disorder. And we rate that as mild, moderate, or severe. And unfortunately, alcohol use disorder is very common in the US. In 2023, there were almost 29 million patients diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. So this is very prevalent. Again, this is a disease and we treat it as such. And we've moved away from using terminology like alcoholism because those are stigmatizing words and stigmatizing language. And because we're trying to define this as a disease, this is not defining the person, but it is a condition that a person may live with. So there's lots of treatment options for alcohol use disorder, but unfortunately less than 10% of patients who are diagnosed with alcohol use disorder in a given year may receive any treatment for this disease. And there's lots of options, as I mentioned. So there's medications that can be used. Those are medications that can help with alcohol cravings, reduce the use and then lead to abstinence. There's also behavioral treatment options. So things like counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling, inpatient, outpatient, it's a not a one size fits all, which is why there's lots of options. Also mutual support groups like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, those are really useful tools for a lot of patients and patients may choose one or all of these options to use to undergo treatment for alcohol use disorder. So what happens to the liver? Well, alcohol is one of the most common causes of cirrhosis. Cirrhosis means scar tissue in the liver. And unfortunately, alcohol-associated liver disease is now the leading cause of liver transplantation in the United States. So of in 2023, of nearly 100,000 liver-related deaths, alcohol was the cause of nearly 45% of those deaths. So it is one of the most common causes of liver disease um, and lots of deaths related to this. 
So what happens when alcohol is ingested in the body? So alcohol is absorbed through the GI tract directly into the bloodstream. Then it's metabolized by the liver. And then alcohol gets converted to molecules that can be harmlessly processed by the body. But during that chemical reaction of creating those harmless pro products, there are intermediate molecules that are created that are actually toxic to the liver. Now, everyone, there's individual variations in how alcohol is metabolized by the bottom, by the body. And that's... Um, related to genetic factors, environmental factors, a patient's nutritional aspects, and the amount of alcohol consumed. Obviously, the more alcohol that's consumed, the more toxic metabolites that are produced that can be toxic to that liver. So what can happen with the alcohol eventually, um, what can alcohol eventually do to the liver? So alcohol causes progressive liver damage, typically in three steps. First, fat sets into the liver. That we call steatosis or fat in the liver. Eventually, that fat turns into scar tissue called fibrosis. And eventually, that fibrosis turns into what's called cirrhosis. This means stage four fibrosis or significant scar tissue in the liver. And at that point, the liver becomes scarred and hardened and it cannot perform the functions that it needs to all the time. Now, there is another sort of separate clinical entity that... Um, can arise in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease. That's called alcohol-associated hepatitis, or previously we called it alcoholic hepatitis. This is a life-threatening acute condition that occur in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease. And it's related to sustained and heavy alcohol consumption that leads to further liver damage and liver inflammation. And this can be life-threatening. A lot of patients, unfortunately, can die from this or require liver transplantation with this condition. And it's treated with alcohol abstinence, and sometimes we give patients steroids as well, so something like prednisone or prednisolone to try to improve the inflammation. But this is sort of on top of those other conditions that we discussed with fat and scar tissue and cirrhosis in the liver. Now let's turn our attention to some symptoms of fatty liver disease. So the problem with liver disease sometimes is that it's pretty asymptomatic. A lot of times it's a silent disease that patients don't know they even have until it may be too late. And so a lot of times patients may not have symptoms, but some symptoms that they may experience early on may be things like fatigue or low energy, low appetite, weight loss, loss of muscle mass because the liver starts stealing your muscles to function. You can sometimes develop abdominal pain, but not always. Some easy bruising can result from this and some dark urine or pale stools. So those are some signs that can result from liver disease, but those may be later signs. And really it's important that if there's any suspicion of liver disease, your primary care doctor is looking into that because again, this can be a silent disease for a very long time. Now, as liver disease progresses, as cirrhosis develops, what can happen? Well, there's buildup of scar tissue in the liver, as I mentioned, and then that results in blood decre decreased blood flow through the liver. Pressure builds up in this in a vein called the portal vein. This is the vein that brings blood into the liver. Eventually, you develop something called portal hypertension. This is high amounts of pressure in that portal vein, and eventually that leads to complications of cirrhosis. So patients can have cirrhosis and buildup of this pressure that doesn't result in complications. That's called compensated cirrhosis. But once that pressure sort of overwhelms the system, then you develop complications of cirrhosis. Those are things called varices, ascites, splenomegaly, encephalopathy, and liver cancer. We'll talk about a little bit more of those on the next slide. So again, those are called, when patients develop those complications, this is what we call decompensated cirrhosis. So ascites is when fluid builds up in the belly, so there's swelling of the belly. Encephalopathy is when toxic metabolites develop in the body, and there's buildup of these toxins that causes confusion. Patients develop varices or these big blood vessels in the esophagus and stomach, and they can cause severe internal bleeding. And also jaundice or yellowing of the eyes and skin, and that's related to dysfunction in the liver. So what kind of testing will your doctor do if there's any suspicion of liver disease or if you may be concerned and bring those concerns to your doctor? First, they're going to order some blood tests. We need to check blood tests to look at the liver function. We also check things like the kidney function, sodium levels in the blood, things that test for platelet counts, like your white blood cell counts, your hemoglobin and platelets, um, and other things. They also will probably do a radiological exam. Sometimes we do something called a fiber scan. This tests how much scar tissue is in the liver and how much fat is in the liver. 
Additionally, they'll probably do an ultrasound of your liver or maybe an, a CT scan or an MRI, depending on how um, what the concerns are. And also we might do an endoscopy. That's something called an um, EGD or endoscopy, where we look for those big blood vessels in the esophagus if there's suspicion that you have cirrhosis. So those are just some of the tests that might be ordered if there's suspicion for liver disease. So we've talked about a lot of some scary issues, and now we're going to talk about the good news. So the good news is that fat and even some scar tissue is reversible. Now it's reversible with abstinence. There is no safe amount of alcohol to drink in the setting of any form of liver disease. So even if there's a little bit of scar tissue or any fat in the liver, there's no safe amount of alcohol to drink. But with reversal of that, if, with abstinence, some of those things can get better. What other things can you do to improve the health of your liver? Well, we already talked about it. Alcohol abstinence is crucial. And the number one, two, three, four, five, six thing that you can do. The next thing you can do is also embrace a healthy lifestyle. So eating things like a Mediterranean diet that consists of lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, lots of whole grains, lean meats, um, things like fish and chicken. So lean proteins, minimizing the salt in your diet, especially if you've started developing some fluid in the abdomen and legs. And then regular exercise that can help reduce some of that fat and scar tissue in the liver. You want to take the medications as prescribed that can help your liver function and also help your alcohol use disorder if that's prescribed. You want to establish care with a primary care provider, but also with a liver specialist that really has expertise in this area. You want to stay up to date on vaccinations. When patients have liver disease, their immune system is not as robust as somebody without liver disease. So you want to make sure that you are protecting yourself from any other diseases that may arise, like the flu or hepatitis A or B. And you want to ask questions and ask for help. So we're not able to help unless we know what's going on. You want to be as honest with your providers as possible because we're not here to judge or place blame. We are solely here to help and try to give you the best possible scenario to overcome some of these obstacles that you may be experiencing. So what if all of those things, despite your best efforts, the liver disease does not improve with abstinence? Liver transplantation is an option. Now you want to ask your doctor about this and alcohol abstinence is absolutely a requirement for this, but there's no minimum amount of time that you must be abstinent before consideration for liver transplantation. Now, this is sometimes center dependent, depending on where you go and which university setting. However, most patients and will be considered for at least evaluation for transplantation and consideration. And that's always something that you should ask about. And finally, where can you find help? So this is the probably the most important slide. Um, so obviously, the ALF has lots of great information on their website that you can go to. We have a Facebook group, group that's um, for patients with alcohol-associated liver disease, a support group that you can go to. Uh, there's also places where you can click to find treatment for alcohol use disorder in your area. You just enter your zip code, and then it can show you the different areas that you can um, seek help in. And that's, that's what I've got for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. German. That's great information for all of us. And I appreciate these links as well. And I hope that this will sort of send people to the correct area for appropriate information. I did have a couple of questions for you based on some of the information that you've covered. And one is you talked about other factors that can contribute to alcohol associated liver disease based on genetics and environment, et cetera. So does that mean that you can have alcohol associated liver disease separate from having alcohol use disorder. Yes, that is correct. So even in the setting of the, in the, even in the absence of alcohol use disorder, you can still develop liver disease with alcohol consumption, especially if other patients have other risk factors. So maybe they have obesity or diabetes, high blood pressure that can also increase their risk of developing fat in the liver. And those two together can sort of work synergistically to develop liver disease. So yes, you absolutely can get liver disease within the absence of alcohol use disorder. Thank you. And then my last question is a little bit about the stigma that you touched on. You mentioned that it's so important to be honest with your doctor and sometimes it can be challenging to be honest with yourself as well. What is the best way to, I guess, prepare going into an appointment that maybe you don't quite feel ready to be completely honest, especially thinking of a questionnaire where maybe that question does come up. What are kind of some of your tips in terms of being able to address where you are personally at with your physician at that time? 
Yeah, that is a really, really tough thing that there is a big stigma associated with liver disease in general, and especially with alcohol use disorder. And that's why a lot of our terminology has also changed because we're trying to get away from that stigmatizing language. So we don't call it alcoholism. We call it alcohol use disorder. It's not, we're not there to place blame on the patients, but being, having the best most honest conversation with your doctor will be the most productive for you because the more honest you are, the more we know how to help somebody. So the more we are aware of the risk factors and can steer patients in the right direction. But it is very hard to get away from that. And it's, you know, it takes time and building trust with your provider to know that they are there to care for you and to really be able to open up about those kind of things. So we understand how tough it is. And again, we're just not here. We're not here to place blame or judge. It is a safe space. It's a safe environment to try to just get you the best care you need. That is such a great reminder that you guys are there to provide support and help and to really be that safe space when maybe there aren't other spaces around that individual that feel as safe. And that just leads me into my last question about support. You talked about different ways with AA and online support groups, et cetera. And of course, ALF does offer our online support group as well. How important is that support when you are going through any kind of liver disease, but especially for someone who maybe does have alcohol use disorder as well? That support is critical. I mean, having other patients maybe that have gone through this process and understand what's going on uh, and that can maybe provide guidance for you is so important. So getting into those you know, support groups or AA and hearing other people's stories just makes you feel a little bit maybe less lonely in this disease. Um, and just knowing that it is such a prevalent disease and you are not alone in this. And uh, it is really important to get support from your family, from your friends and from other peers that may have gone through this as well. Well, I really appreciate you taking time with us today. This has been such a great conversation and I am looking forward to being able to connect with more people through our Facebook group as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you.